Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. ESCOM has offered a gloomy prognosis for the state of the electricity system and the company for the foreseeable future. Terence Creamer joins me to analyse what this could mean for business and for South Africa. Hi Terence. Hi. ESCOM is now living on the edge according to its CEO, Chidiso Matona. That's correct. You know, I think that uh, we got the message this week that the crisis that we've known has been around with us since 2008 and even prior to that, back to 2006, is really with us and is not going to go away anytime soon. And a key reason is really that we've got this very long delay in the introduction of new capacity from the Madupi and the Kusile power stations. And, you know, these are mega projects and uh, in some ways if we look back and we've got 2020 hindsight going ahead with such large, two such large mega projects at once, this was always going to make us vulnerable. Mega projects tend to be over time and often over budgets, not only in South Africa, but it's particularly uh, stressful in South Africa where we have a skills shortage, where we haven't built such power stations over uh, many, many years or decades. So that's, uh, you know, we, we, we're living in a period where the Madupi power station, which was uh, supposed to be synchronized uh, to, well, the first few units should be up and running already and producing electricity. The first one we're still hoping will be synchronized this year. ESCOM has given the indication that it's pretty close uh, to synchronizing the first unit at Madupi, that's uni unit six. Um, but it's probably going to be possibly, well, it will be delayed beyond the 24th of December. Hopefully they'll scavenge some time and, and start it by the end of the year, but probably realistically it's going to start sometime early in uh, 2015. And then there'll be a six month period of ramp up. And then we still don't know the interval period between the, the units. The, the view is that we should be able to see unit six, uh, five, which would be the second unit at Madupi coming in by December 2015. At the same time, we should see Kusile unit one coming on, but that schedule hasn't been confirmed nor have the revised cost estimates been uh, delivered by Eskim. So we, we're still waiting bad news on that front. So that's really where we're at. And then the other big issue is that uh, the plant that Eskim uh, is operating, the current fleet, which is coal-fired dominated, is uh, in its midlife. It's been run hard for lo too long. And the elect energy availability factor out of these units uh, has fallen quite uh, dramatically over the last few years. When I first started as a journalist, we used to get 90% availability out of these uh, um, power stations. Um, we're now looking at around 75%, 76% in the first half. I imagine the second half is going to be worse, given that we've already uh, had a periods of load shedding during the this, uh, this second half of Eskom's financial year. And uh, there's no real quick fix with regard to the energy availability factor because it's about getting that older plant maintained and there's a big, a quite a large maintenance backlog and that has a history to it of its own and that history pro probably relates mostly to the way we ran the plant uh, in the run-up or well, post the 2008 crisis when you no know, confidence uh, had to be rebuilt. Uh, we still had the uh, World Cup to host and there was a mandate given to Eskom to keep the right lights on so that we could rebuild confidence in the South Africa's ability to host that tournament and rebuild confidence that, you know, in the economy generally. And uh, we're now paying the price for that seriously and we're having to catch up that maintenance and uh, a lot of focus has to be, is being given to that. Uh, but with, um, with this tight system, with the lack of new supply coming on, on stream, you know, any minor event or major event, we've had a few major events at, in Eskom uh, over the last couple of years, the most recent being the Majuba incident with the coal silo collapsing, but there have been others. <coughs> so any minor or major event really pushes uh, the system we really over the edge. And that's why Tsidisa Matona said this week and um, uh, confirmed that we are living on the edge. Is there any good news amid the gloom? I think the main good news is that there's a bit more honesty about how bad things are. Now, no, no one really wants to hear the bad news, but for many, for many years, uh, uh, there have been warnings that this is going to take longer to come right, especially if the supply side um, options, which is really the Madupi and Kasili, were delayed, which was becoming clearer and clearer that they were delayed. And there was this warning that, uh, you know, the system's tight and it's being run hard and unless we start maintaining, we're going to enter crisis. Now, that word was a, a word that was not allowed really to be used uh, in the Eskom uh, language. 
but that word is now being used a bit more openly and we are in a crisis and a new CEO I think has a little bit more scope coming from the Department of Public Enterprises, so coming out of government to say it uh, as it is and I think the fact that we're not burying our head in the sand anymore with regard to the crisis is an important breakthrough. The other s slight bit of uh, good news is I think that uh, the country is wanting to pull together in some ways. I think we saw um, uni the union Solidaritat, who has been very critical of Eskom, trying to say we need really to put our differences aside. Yeah, we're still, you know, unhappy with the way Eskom has got us into this problem, but we're wanting to do what we can. We've got 7,000 members, they say working for Eskom, and these are very, very important people at the power stations. These are the guys that really are, you know, right on the factory floor on the power station sites and keep the lights on. And the fact that they are, are handing up, you know, holding out this olive branch, I think, is some much good news. I think, I think generally there's a, a view in business that this is serious, that we want to try and find ways to look at what are the, some of the short-term remedies to get us through this very, very tight period, especially this summer, which is our high maintenance period. So up until uh, the end of February, March, really, uh, there's going to be a lot of maintenance happening and the, any, as I said, minor events could push the system over the edge. So I think business is also trying to, one, while doing their energy efficiency, but really thinking about how they can maybe engage with Eskom a bit more. We've already seen a lot, uh, big uh, industrial, uh, industrial customers coming through you know, over the last um, a number of years, I think we've lent heavily on those industrial customers. It hasn't been really good for the economy, and they are still prepared to deliver that uh, 10%, and they're doing it on a regular basis. And then I think what we're seeing now, the shift now is the very painful shift for citizens, is the shift from the f in focus from leaning on those industrial customers to leaning more heavily on South African c citizens, so households. And that's why we're seeing load shedding more and more taking place on weekends. Now, weekends are not a, a period where we usually would have expected load shedding because demand really does fall off from Friday afternoon. And um, But Eskom is having to use those periods over the weekend to rebuild reserves. Now, those reserves relate to their hydropower state plants that are really, they have to pump water up the hills and then drop that water so over the period to um, to release the power. So they use that to, 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 you know, to rebuild those water reserves and then to rebuild their or replenish their diesel stocks. Um, and that diesel, it's a, it's a very sad story because although that's what is keeping our lights on every day, it's a very, very expensive uh, solution and one that uh, Eskom is barely really able to afford. And I think in the second half of the year, we're going to see Eskom's uh, profitability all but wiped out from you know, around the nine billion level that they made in the first half to only around 500 million um, in the second half. So it's a massive eight billion swing in the second half. And a lot of that has got to do with you know, this, um, uh, the amount they're having to spend on diesel. And uh, they're also having to make provision for the coal that they're not really using anymore uh, because Madupi is not up and running. So they're having to buy that. It's a take or pay type arrangement with the coal producer for the Madupi, so they've had to set aside a 2.5 billion rand provision there. So there's massive financial um, uh, problems. But then the, the other thing that's not as gloomy is that I think government as the shareholder, while I don't think they've come fully to the party, I think they have realized the seriousness of the situation. We saw that in the October statement of uh, Finance Minister Nkantlanene and the way he dealt with it in his uh, medium-term budget policy statement and outlined the support package for Eskom. Now, that's clearly not going to be enough for Eskom. It will be for its short-term liquidity issues. But I think it's part of a bigger package uh, that tries to salvage the financial situation um, at Eskom. So we have a, a sort of short-term solution for the immediate liquidity uh, uh, issues that Eskom was uh, facing, and that requires government to come up with 20 to 23 billion rand and inject that as the shareholder as a, in the form of equity over the next or well starting from the next financial year in tranches from April 1 next year but it's not going to be sufficient to get Eskom out of the current financial problem that they're in which I think there's going to be a more leaning or more heavy leaning on the regulator to make a decision and a determination around tariffs 
We've already seen that from April 1, 2015, tariffs aren't going to rise at 8%. They're going to rise at over 12% because that's really the, the clawback that they've already been granted in terms of the second multi-year price determination period. And whether the, that um, regulatory clawback will be sufficient for Eskom to close the other financial revenue gaps is not yet clear. So I think we'll see that what they call the, um, the, re the clearing account being used again by Eskom, but we may still see a approach back to the regulator for a reopen around this tariff for the MYPD3 period, which is going to be quite tra traumatic for South Africa again. Um, but it has been on the horizon for some time that we will definitely see higher tariffs coming through. And then I think the only other bit of good news is uh, there seems to be some movement, although it's not 100% clear how fast that's going uh, on the RPP program. The renewable program's done very well, but there's been some stalling there. But we're expecting the baseload and cogen to come out quite soon. Um, the sooner the better, because actually <laughs> The base load projects are going to take some time to reach financial close. And um, you know, once they get shovels in the ground and eventually start producing electricity, it's going to be <laughs> coinciding with the units, the 12 units coming on at um, Madupi and Kosile. So the, the relevance is going to be far less. So we're very far behind the curve in terms of IPPs. So it's, it's you know, with every bit of good news, there's a bit of downside as well. So there, there is, um, I think the only good news really that we can say is that the, the seriousness of the situation is being grasped by everybody. What could be done to deal with the short-term crisis and the longer-term risks? Well, the short-term <coughs> the short term is very difficult. It's really about the energy availability factor and trying to recover that as best as we can. And that requires some immediate uh, short-term, it's a short-term remedy, but it requires some immediate-term pain for South Africa because there's only one way to really get that energy availability factor up and that's really to really accelerate um, the maintenance program which means there'll be more units out not uh, and able to produce and uh, that makes the system very very vulnerable. Eskom sticking to its maintenance schedule doggedly but it might need to accelerate it if we want to really raise that the, the target for EAF is 80% now we're well off that and to get there is going to possibly require a uh, serious conversation with the South African public about how we get there and what it's going to mean in terms of not only our weekends but possibly some of our weekdays uh, and load shedding. So there's that is the immediate um, uh, re you know, low hanging fruit but it's not an easy one to grasp. It's, it's going to be politically quite tricky to navigate as well because whenever there's load shedding there's confidence issues that come in and not only for the immediate psychology of the public and business but for their future you know do they really want to invest in a country that can't provide uh, important networked industries so i think it's going to be a, a conversation rather than a, or a process rather than an event but i think at some point we're going to have to look realistically at that then the other really short-term lever is the demand side and uh, here again it's a might come down to a regulatory in intervention because that is what was really taken away from Eskom uh, to, a large, uh, to a large degree in the tariff determination. So they, they had a number of programs in place that were going quite well. But the, re the regulator probably quite correctly said this is not the right place. They're not the right institution to be running these demand side programs and took it away. But then everything is stalled. So we've seen everywhere um, these programs are not going at the pace that they should. And those are a lot cheaper than burning the diesel and the open cycle gas turbines. So I think that's another lever that we need to have a, a public-private conversation around the financing mechanism around that. Uh, maybe doing a ring fence type of financing model with the private sector where there's some sort of cost recovery. Whether it can be left out of the tariff is, is, is hard to see, but to, to find some sort of solution to restart at a larger scale those, those two, that, that intervention. Um, and then uh, I suppose then the more medium term is to get the RPPs running and to not have any more stalling around that. And then we need to have a, a much bigger conversation about the long-term role of Eskom and what is its role, how is it going to be financed, what is the, its role in the electricity supply industry, what is the role of RPPs. If we're going to rely more heavily on private power producers, then we need a different structure probably because we can't have a referee player 
type arrangement that we have at the moment uh, in the Eskom structure. But to, to focus on that sort of level of restructuring now when we're in a crisis might be counterproductive, but we do need to start that discussion. And, uh, and also have once and for all some clarity around you know, the future demand outlook uh, that is then translated into a plan, which is the integrated resource plan, because the current one, everyone would agree, even those that are working around the nuclear program and using the 9,600 megawatts of nuclear in that program would agree that that plan is out of date. Um, and we need to update that so that there's some certainty around how we're going to approach this uh, electricity supply and, and bringing in new generation in future. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Yeah, so